Here we are with David Challey and to break down these brand new last, last battleground We've been polls. here three days in a row now. We got our final two battleground states, North Carolina and Georgia in the southeast. And they tell a similar story as what we've been seeing all week long. No clear leader in these states. It's a one point race in each of them. In Georgia, among likely voters, our brand new poll shows Trump at 48% support, Harris at 47% support. It's the flip in North Carolina. Harris is at 48% support among likely voters there. Trump at 47% support. One point races. Let's go Again, in. Again, no clear leader. No clear leader. This is, this is a basically a tie, folks. Yeah. This is a toss-up election. Let's go inside Georgia first in terms of some of the coalition groups here. Independent voters, and again, I just want to say, we're comparing likely voters in a poll and to what actually happened with voters in the 2020 exit polls. These are two different universes, but instructive. Among independent voters in our poll, Trump has a seven-point advantage in Georgia. In Georgia in 2020, Biden won independent voters by nine points. So that's a potential warning sign there for Harris. Black voters in Georgia in our poll, 71 percentage point advantage over Trump for Harris. That's about where Biden was. He was at 77 points in the exit polls in terms of his advantage over Trump. White non-college voters down in Georgia, Trump has a 66 wow. percentage point advantage in our poll. That is his base. We should expect it. It's actually even bigger than his advantage was in Georgia in the exit polls, but in that range. In North Carolina, let's look at these same groups here. Among independent voters, Harris has a four-point advantage over Trump in our poll. That's where Biden was with independent voters in the exit polls in 2020. Remember, he lost North Carolina in 2020 yes, by a did. narrow margin. Black voters, uh, 59 wow. percentage point advantage. This wow. is a huge potential warning sign. Wow. In the in the exit polls, in, in he Biden won black vote in North Carolina by 85 percentage points. Uh, Harris, this this is something she's going to want to watch for in the closing days. And then you see the white non-college here. This is perhaps a little bit of diminishment of support among Trump's base than he had four years ago. Also in North Carolina, that governor's race. Mm -hmm. You all remember the story about Mark Robinson, of course. Uh, his support plummeted. He's at 37%. Josh Don is likely to be the next governor, a Democrat in North Carolina. And some Democrats say having this race off the map uh, was a detriment to them keeping every Democrat in North Carolina enthused. Yeah, which is a little bit counterintuitive, right. you would think. But, you know, uh, who's left to win over? Well, take a look at this. So 95% in both states, mine made up. Obviously, there's this small universe, but we just heard our Ebony Davis ask Vice President Harris when you were playing the sound before, what is your argument to these final movable voters? And her answer was immediately about the economy and bringing prices down. And then, Dana, we take a look at those voters who tell us they've already voted. So among those in these states who tell us they already voted, in Georgia, that's 59% of the folks in our poll. Harris wins them 51% to 44%. In North Carolina, 52% of our poll respondents tell us they already voted, so again, a majority. And Harris is winning them here 51% to 45%. I will just note, these are closer among those that tell us that they've already voted for Harris than we see in those blue wall states uh, where she had more of an advantage with those who tell us they already voted, Dana. So interesting. I'm over here now, David. Thank you so Thanks. much for doing this. That's, we are off. Uh, what our uh, friend Lisa Lair at the New York Times calls the polar coaster now. One more thing, though. As of this hour, the total number of early voters, this is actual voters, crossed the 60 million mark. 60 million. That likely means well more than one third of Americans who intend to vote already have voted. Let's break all of this down with my great group of reporters here, CNN's Phil Mattingly, CNN's Kristen Holmes, Laura Barone Lopez of the PBS NewsHour. Um, what do you make of those two battleground states and what they tell us? I mean, are we really off the polar coaster <laughs> on some level? I'm off. Come on. I don't think, I don't think anybody can be. I'll watch in, from the ground and in wave. In large part because everything is saying the same exact thing, which is that this is a razor thin race. It is as close as it could possibly be. There has been no breakout. There has been no turn. Honestly, and we all kind of look at cross tabs like total nerds most of the time when we get something like this, particularly at this point in the election. I think what was interesting to me is twofold. One, the big question down in Georgia in particular is black voters, Will they yeah. come back even more? There was some concern, obviously, of slippage. It's been a, a, a huge point uh, that everybody's been talking about over the course of the last several months, particularly with black men. There have been signs, based on people I've talked to on the ground, that, okay, once we reach them, 
we can get them back. It's a matter of reaching them. Is their turnout effort, which is expansive down in that state, having a real effect? Young voters in the early vote down there as well have been a higher number than they've seen. How's that going to turn out? The big thing, though, was the 5%, I think, in both states uh -huh. that are still persuadable, which tracks with what we've heard from both campaigns. That's There's right. There's 3 to 5% out there that they're fighting over, which means a lot could happen in the next five days. Right, and it sounds like a nothing percentage, but when it's a dead heat, it's, it, it's a lot. What about you? I think the most striking thing to me was those North Carolina numbers among white, non-educated voters for Donald Trump. Uh, there was a roughly 20-point gap there between 2020 and 20 uh, and now. I think that really goes to show you why Donald Trump has spent so much time in North Carolina in recent days and leading up to the election. We know he's going to have several more stops in the state. They really feel like in that state they need to drive up people going to the polls, particularly his base. He had not spent a ton of time in that state. They really believed when Joe Biden was at the top of the ticket that they were going to easily win it. They have seen the movement in the polls in the last several weeks, and they do believe that that is a state that could potentially be at risk. Now, looking at those crosstabs, looking at those white non-educated voters, mm -hmm. that is likely why they are spending so much time in that state. Yeah, I mean, black voter turnout might be down a little bit right now in those states, and that is certainly a concern for Harris. But they probably are looking at those numbers you just mentioned and are happy about that, Hope, hoping that, you know, she's driving up turnout in the suburbs in states like North Carolina. They like it when they see big suburban turnout. Uh, also, right now, in early voting, women are leading men by, I think, double digits. And that's a yeah. big deal for Harris because she clearly is betting that women are going to turn out more for her than for Trump. I'm glad you mentioned that. Let's look at the actual early voting uh, in these key states. And this is just the people who are voting. We don't know who they're voting for. But women uh, are besting men in early voting in each one of these states. And Phil Mattingly, you seem the, like the most appropriate person to talk to at this table about the female vote. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to the beginning of the program, what we played from Donald Trump, it's like the most vintage Donald Trump moment ever where people say to him, you don't probably don't want to say you're the protector of women. So he goes out and he says, not only am I the protector of women, I'm going to protect them even when they don't want to be protected. Kamala Harris jumps on it this morning. Um, given how big of a role gender, the gender of voters, um, and the, the discussion about gender, whether it's reproductive rights or anything else, is playing, how do you think this is going to impact where we are. Should note, it's also vintage because not only did he, was he told it was condescending and then doubled down with more condescending, he actually relayed the smart political advice he got. That's right. In a play-by-play -play conversation and then still did it anyway, which is kind of like the epitome of, of Trump, a Trump rally on some level. You know, the thing that I don't have a good read on, and I would be surprised if anybody does at this point, is we talk constantly about how the Trump campaign has been laser focused and really done an expansive effort to pull in younger male voters. Mm -hmm. Male voters, generally, the gender gap is, is huge uh, with men going his way. But younger male voters in particular, reaching out to them, connecting with them, getting them registered. They're low propensity. They're not a group that tends to uh, be anything but ambivalent when it comes to voting. Whether or not doing so, and this is what Nikki Haley was referring to earlier this mm -hmm. week, has actually served as a turnout boost mm -hmm. for Democrats, for the Harris campaign with women. The gender gap is enormous. The gender gap among young voters in particular is even larger. And whether or not that their kind of pathway, how they're going to thread the needle on this on the Trump side, ends up kind of inverting itself on the Democratic side and helping Harris is like the big question that will likely decide the election. And on the gender gap, I mean, Harris's camp, uh, campaign chair, Jen O'Malley Dillon, told reporters this week that they are really hoping that those women that voted maybe silently for abortion in 2022 stick with Democrats uh, this cycle around. And I was just talking to a two-time Trump voter in Arizona who had been undecided, a woman, and she said just yesterday she told me that she's basically decided and she's going to vote for Harris this time around. And abortion has a big, is a big reason why she's doing that.